thousand years. Even today, there is little that creates more excitement or generates more greed, the news of a big gold strike. It was just such an announcement that started BC's latest gold rush this summer. Test results from drill hole number 109 set the Vancouver stock market spiraling upward to the highest peak of trading in BSE history, and Calpine Resources became something close to a household name. But its claim is just one of thousands in an isolated corner of northwestern BC. Tonight we begin a five-part series on the new gold rush. We'll tour mines so remote you'll wonder how they ever found them, and we'll try to separate the hype from the reality. But we begin tonight by exploring the mystique of the metal itself, especially inside the Golden Triangle. The flame burns 2,000 degrees hot. In the crucible, the metal men have fought over, died for, gold. Twenty-four carats pure. It is more than a metal. Gold is currency, as solid as paper money is fickle. In eras past, the rush for gold was the rush to the nearest stream. Prospectors knew the big strike could come out of the next pan. Today's gold is more elusive. Men and their equipment must go deep into the earth to find it. But it seems no place is too forbidding in the search for gold. I would say there's a fine line between greed and good judgment. And sometimes it's the yellow metal of the gold that causes people to cross that line. The fact that it's so readily apparent, the value that it has, immediately when it's completed processing, I think has a great deal to do with it. Gold's value has gone unchallenged for centuries. In ancient Egypt, the pharaohs wore gold jewelry as a sign of authority and power. When you unravel a, a lot of chains or any type of gold, people's eyes just light up. They just love the look of it and the feel of it. Some people say they can even actually smell it. The world demands some 60 million ounces of gold a year. About a third of that goes into gold jewelry. We love to wear gold. Why? is gold so precious ask any miner any prospector any jeweler they'll all have a different theory but there are a couple of things that they agree on one is it's portable from ancient times if you were invaded you had to leave in a hurry you could just take the gold that you were wearing with you and you'd be sure that it would be worth something when you reach the other end of your journey Secondly, it lasts. We can still wear the gold that the Egyptians were wearing 4,000 years ago. Gold never dies. Yeah, I know what gold does to men's souls. You talk as though you struck it rich sometime or other, Pop. How about it? And what are you doing in here, a down and outer? That's the gold. That's what it makes for us. Never knew a prospector yet that died rich. Make one fortune, should have blow it in trying to find another. Here's some of that ore from over there, eh? Prospectors are still staking claims in BC today. Some use the traditional tools, and some use high technology. But because you rarely see gold in the rock today, eventually you have to drill. First from the surface, and then if those results are promising, from underground. And even those who work with the rock may not know when they've struck it rich. You invest in gold or gold yeah. stock? Yeah, yeah, doesn't any miner, maybe that's why I'm still broke. Huh? A miner and a gambler? Eh? You might say that, yeah. They go together, I think. No sure bets at all. It's a, it's a gamble, and uh, the stakes are high, I guess, and uh, not everybody comes out a winner. Gold can go up, and it can go down. 
You might win Lotto 69, you might lose it. Okay? I'd like to book the Lotto 69. <laughs> that's life. It's a bit of a gamble. But that's what it's the name of the game. Because this is the flip side of the gold gamble, the stock market. They say gold drives the Vancouver Stock Exchange. They've been saying lately that Murray Pezum drives gold. This is the property that has fueled Gold Rush 89, S.K. Creek, half-owned by Calpine Resources. I think it's going to be so big it will go down in history <coughs> as the greatest. Honestly, please believe me. I, I know the mining industry. I know exploration. I've been saying this right along, not just today, but I've said it months ago. Now you watch what happens here. What Pezum is describing is not just his property, but the whole area north of Stewart along the Alaska Panhandle. They call this the Golden Triangle. And in it, believers say, are six million ounces of gold. There are thousands of claims, ten major properties. At Newhawk, they've tunneled in a mile. The Kerr property where they were looking for gold and found copper. SNP, Kaminko, and a Murray Pezum Company. They've spiraled their way through the core of Johnny Mountain. Also on Johnny, Skyline, a producing gold mine, but not a profitable one yet. And the latest reincarnation of the granddaddy of them all, the Premier Mine, opened first 70 years ago. From tons of rock, all they can expect is a few ounces of gold. Why bother? Gold has a tremendous relationship with love and sex. Love and sex? Absolutely. Didn't you know that? Well... A tremendous <laughs> relationship. Uh, who buys most of the gold? The guys to give it to their girls. 30% of the gold uh, sold in the world is in jewelry. Yep. So it, it's the guys who love the girl or want to get her into bed, uh, buy her gold trinkets, gold, gold this, gold that. Eh? So there's a tremendous relationship there. You think about it. <laughs> yeah, I don't expect to find nuggets of molten gold. It's rich, but not that rich. And here ain't the place to dig. It comes from someplace further up, up there. Up there's where we got to go. Up there. Tomorrow. The search for gold in the Golden Triangle. The prospectors and the companies that buy them out. And even with today's high technology, the terrain and the weather present, or rather present quite a challenge to the people who want to mine the Golden Triangle. ghosts in these cabins. They are prospectors from the late 1800s, or the Depression, or perhaps more recent would-be millionaires. 
Come on, Rocky. Jack Hill has yet to earn a penny from the claim he staked here five years ago. During the week, he's one of some 200 employees at the nearby Premier Gold Mine. But on weekends, he works a dream. His own personal mother load. Lots of good quartz there, anyway. I got high hopes for this one. But we have to go, we have to go underground here to, to see it, eh? And that, Where we see rust-colored rock, kind of known as a Gawson, right Jack here. sees a gold mine. But he says he's going to develop it the way the old timers did. Jack won't diamond drill from the surface to find his gold. He's going to tunnel, follow his instincts to the gold underground. And we have another vein structure down there. I'll take you down. That's the main one. Small amount of gold is good. You got big tonnage. Watch this. You get real bad ground conditions. And it always seems to be a good, good ore, you know. And like the old timers, his hands, his hammer, and his eyes will lead him in the right direction. I'm not, I'm not sure, you know, but that, that those black streaks there, that could be a, like a, a tetrahedrite, you know. Could be that. I got some good samples here. It's 28 ounces here. How did but, you find this? Well, I just, uh, I just, you know, was when I was working at Scotty Gold, eh? I just, uh, on the weekends, instead of going to town and getting drunk, we went out prospecting. <laughs> oh, that, oh, that sound. <laughs> he says he was born a miner, and he'll die a miner. If he's lucky, he'll die a rich miner. Basically, uh, you do something, you go on a hobby, and it quite often it runs into something, you know? You get gold fever? You ever get gold fever? <laughs> That's what you gotta have. You gotta have that. that uh, well, you gotta have a lust to get rich. I don't know what else. You know, why would uh, why would else you, uh, anybody want to get doing anything extra for it? <laughs> you have to do everything extra just to look for gold in these hills. Northwestern BC is a photographer's dream. But this place is a miner's nightmare. The hunt for gold takes miners over glaciers thousands of years old. It brought Bob Hewton to what is now Selfrette's gold. 5,000 feet above sea level, miles from anywhere. But the rust-colored rock was a sign of gold. When high-tech prospectors spotted this Gawson, as it's called, from the air, they moved in for a closer look. What they found was not only gold, but a $2 billion copper deposit. They're drilling now to see if they can mine it economically. So on a rock like this, you have a lot of key signs that indicate you're near the mineralization, although you're not actually in it. When you see signs like this that give you a good, good indication there's mineralization present, then you can justify the cost of bringing in the drills and geophysical equipment. If you can get in, this helicopter had to circle a while before the fog broke. The helicopter is the workhorse of northern exploration. Sulphurette spent almost 100000 a month on them this summer. The pilots have to know their stuff. This is a tough area to fly in. If you you got to push the weather to a to a certain point, or you just won't get any work done. But you got to know when to stop. Don't want to be a st statistic. <laughs> Helicopters bring everything in, from machines to men, and they won't take the 20 men here out for two months. When they're not looking for gold and finding copper, they're building the camp, with only the occasional bird for company. They're a long way from home and its modern conveniences. 
In this crew, geologist Scott Castleman doubles as cleanup man and counselor. He keeps Sigmund Freud on hand for isolated mines. That, uh, we keep that around for keeping people sane throughout the summer. Some people tend to go a little off the handle. We just give them that book and uh, that'll bring them back down to earth. Because of this rust-colored earth, sulfurets will spend 10 million just to decide whether a mine is feasible. An expensive roll of the dice, but... As we say, the average geologist in his knife to lifetime never finds a mine. So, yes, there are far more losers than there are winners. But there's always hope. It's like buying lottery tickets. Far more losers than winners, but if you're a winner, why well, you make a lot of money. Gossen and gold don't always go together. The gold on the Skyline property, for example, was hidden under innocent-looking grasses. Which is why Fred Seiberg prospects with equipment NASA would be proud of. <coughs> Sensors he's carrying measure changes in the Earth's magnetic field. Those changes usually signal metal in the rock. This is a geophysical prospecting tool. I got a special piece of computer and a couple of sensors. One up here, one back here. Fred's sensors later feed a computer, which spews out a map, which tells the company where they're most likely to find what they're after. And that's exactly what Skyline is doing. Drilling for gold found by a computerized prospector. And it speeds up and expedites an exploration program. It does not replace the old prospector, but it, in one season we can cover uh, vastly more uh, ground that you could in old time prospecting ways. Just down the mountain from Skyline, a landing strip on the Iskut River. This is the Snip property, owned 60% by Cominco and 40% by a Murray Pezum company. They're searching for gold here too, but they've gone into the mountain to find it. This is an exploratory shaft. They've tunneled just under two miles, just to see whether it's worth putting a mine in. The miners seem to prefer the work underground to drilling on the surface. The exploration side of things, you. Uh drill and drill and drill and uh, you're looking for the stuff you never see it you come down here and a few drill holes a few bangs of the hammer and it's there for you to see you're not a, you're not discovering it but uh, it's nice to see it snip already employs 50 people and countless machines Kaminko and prime resources have already spent 20 million dollars in development including a two million dollar bunkhouse and they won't make the final decision on whether to put a mine here for another two months this is how the big boys search for gold but that doesn't matter a damn to the little guy Jack Hill is happy looking for gold the way the old timers did. Carrying his rocks into town to be assayed, knowing any day now he could hit the big strike. Take the miner who prospected from this cabin. Tom Mackay's claim was still worth little when he died. Today, it's the hottest gold property in BC. I get that image, the promoter, the big fat cigar, the girls flying around. That is not me. Have you ever seen me in a bar? I don't, I won't even go into a bar. You don't need to go into a bar. No, I'm high right now, you know, just doing what I do. <laughs> Tomorrow, the highs and the lows of the Vancouver stock market game. And the gold that drives it. The art of promotion and how little it might reflect the reality in the rock 
It was Vancouver's top promoter who pushed the Vancouver Stock Exchange all the way to record heights this summer. The property, SK Creek, might well be worth all the excitement, and yet they are still a long way from even deciding if they'll put in an actual mine. It all comes down to this. Put money into gold and you're investing. Put it into gold stocks and you are speculating. And there is speculation to spare in the golden triangle. The Vancouver Stock Exchange stands or falls on gold stocks. This spring it was falling. Gold was down, so was investor confidence. got to get Peter Brown for me right. immediately. Right. Everyone's benefiting uh, right now from Murray Peasant. That is correct, yes. How much of this is your companies and companies related to your group? Uh, that's an embarrassing question, but of the value? Perhaps 60%. Then came SK Creek and the now famous Hole 109. Drill hole number 109 showed a very large, very high-grade gold deposit. Based on more than 120 core samples to date, the owners boast there could be 5 million ounces of gold here. We believe we have discovered a world-class ore body. Uh, one of such magnitude, we don't even know how big it is yet. Uh, certainly, it, it, as far as I'm concerned, it reminds me of the Hemlo discovery. So Murray Pezum strikes it richer, but he wasn't the one who discovered this potential gold mine. It was Tom Mackay in the middle here. World War II was still seven years away when this picture was taken. Mackay was a manager at the nearby Premier Mine. On his days off, Mackay used to hire airplanes and fly over the area, looking for the rock formations that signal gold. In 1932, he spotted this area, and he and his buddies moved in for a closer look. Before long, they were staking their claim on SK Creek. They couldn't wait to get their hammers into the rock. Mackay was so convinced there was a big strike here, he documented the occasion on film. Tom Mackay always said this will be one of the greatest mines in BC history. It was he who formed the company that's now consolidated Stikine, Pezum's partner in the property. But Tom Mackay died seven years ago, after half a century of exploration, and before this year's big find. Mackay may be gone. Those who followed him feel his presence just the same. People had good feelings for this area for over 50 years, and they spent money, serious money, over that 50-year period. And they were so close to this, you know, they could have tasted it. And the fellow that basically found the property, Tom McKay, was involved with it for that full 50 years. And his widow is still on our board and stones the king. So I think, you know, there's some real satisfaction to see success with long-term effort. You know, finally, he was right. How right he was becomes clearer with every hole drilled. Though you can rarely see gold in the rock, they now know precisely how much gold is in the core samples they've got. This is where they grind the guesswork out of gold ore, an assay lab. Here at Ecotech, the rock is meticulously weighed and heated to 1,000 degrees. The resulting ore is then reheated, and what's left is a minute amount of gold, silver, and other precious metals. They're accurate to within one billionth of a gram. No speculation here. It's a long way from the assay labs to the Vancouver Stock Exchange. 
But it's here that those results start to make a difference because it's based on assay results that the stock prices initially start to move. Consider this summer's gold stock rush. In June, before Hole 109 came in, Tom Mackay's consolidated stickeen was sitting at about 775. It's high since Hole 109, 5950. The same with Peasants Calpine Resources. Before Hole 109, it was sitting at $1.28. It's high since $9.75. But surrounding properties with far less solid information to go on were caught in the upward spiral too. Canark went from 55 cents before hole 109 to a high of 305 following the announcement. And Adrian Resources, 24 cents before the big break at SK Creek. It's high since $4.40. Adrian and the others have dropped since the highs of August. But even at its current price, Adrian is worth over $13 million. And they haven't drilled a single hole on this property. At this point, it's pure speculation. Wealth, yes, but wealth only on paper. Even at SK Creek, it will be at least two years before the first gold comes out. And already, Calpine and Stikeen are worth $250 million. There's the nature of the risk of the business and uh, just not knowing until you actually get in production. So that's why you have to be very careful about what we talked about, the continuity of the mineralization between drill holes. Mm -hmm. if, there's, if you're not confident and you don't believe that it's there, um, just beware. When I find a mine, it's, uh, to me, no nonsense, it's like having a baby. I love finding mines. I really do, having a baby, yeah. Uh, bringing it in. Once it goes into production, I don't want to know about it, okay? <laughs> that's, that's, not my, that's not my thing, no. Yeah. It's getting out there, exploring and finding the thrill of the game. Nearby Skyline Gold had good promoters, too. Last year, before it opened, its stock was trading at $17. Now the mine is taking gold out, but its stock is worth only 4 there's gold here, but not as much, nor as high a grade, nor as easy to take out as originally billed. The people that they have now are more mining people, whereas the people before were promoters. That's the history with gold mines, I think. Gold is easy to promote. Tomorrow, the two producing mines in the Golden Triangle, and their struggle to get the gold out. Memory has sparked such excitement on Howe Street as the big strike at the SK Creek property this summer. They say now that area properties have a collective stock value of one billion dollars. But it may surprise you to learn that there are just two producing gold mines there. The Premier Mine, an open pit operation, and Skyline Gold, a more traditional underground mine. On the surface, the two mines are very different. But they have one very important thing in common. Neither is yet operating in a net profit. Tonight, the producers and their gamble to make money in the Golden Triangle. The mountains here are at once fabulous and forbidding. They are the guardians of tremendous wealth, but they don't give up their gold easily. Three generations of miners have left their mark here. Many of them rode this old tunnel at the premier gold mine in its heyday, which came, ironically, during the Depression. The premier was one of the richest gold mines in Canada in the 20s and 30s. Nobody was out of work here. There was no road to Stewart in those days. Instead, they moved the gold ore from the mine by a tram, a tram 11 miles long, at times three to 400 feet off the ground. While the rest of the country wallowed in the depression, Stewart men were working overtime to get the gold out. The port of Stewart, 
Canada's northernmost ice-free harbor. It was here that the tram dropped the gold concentrate onto the ships that would take it south for refining. It came out in shiny gold bars. The Stewart of 1989 is a somewhat sleepier town. The 1,500 residents go about their business more quietly, in the shadow of the past, like the hotel that closed before it opened. But always, there is the undercurrent of gold fever. But there's still that aura of, of uh, out there, there's another mine, there's, there's uh, another buck to be made in the market. Uh, it's there, you know, the feeling is there. You go in the coffee shop in the morning, and that's what they talk about, the price of gold, and, and what's this stock done, and what this, how that guy is not operating his mine correctly. You know, a lot of armchair managers, a lot of armchair managers. At the old mine site, the manager's house is overrun. But the silence is about to be broken. They've come back to the premier mine for more gold. Westmin Resources has returned to recover the low-grade ore the old-timers left behind. It's an open pit operation. They move the rock to the mill by the truckload, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The Premier Gold Project opened here just two months ago, and already they've taken a substantial chunk out of this mountainside. And when you realize how little gold they get for their efforts, you understand what a precious metal it really is. For instance, on these two benches behind me, they removed 700 tons of rock. They recovered 42 ounces of gold. Think of 42 gold coins. Of course, they plan to recover much more than that. They've spent 85 million, and they want that money back. The ability to squeeze gold out of rock can make or break a mine. Premier crushes up to 2,000 tons of ore a day, then mixes it with a cyanide solution which grabs the gold and silver from the ore. Later, the gold and silver is taken off using carbon. The cyanide is neutralized. Yo. The computer needs just five people a shift to operate the whole mill. Together with the chemicals and the machines, they reduce tons of ore to sheets of grimy black powder, which they heat to 1,200 degrees centigrade. Molten dory, or gold and silver. The refiners watch closely to ensure none of this precious liquid is spilled. From thousands of tons of ore, all they get is a few bars. A bar is mostly silver. Only 10 to 12 percent is gold. This is low-grade ore. It's a low-grade deposit, yes. You got to take a lot of rock to get a little bit of gold. Yes. Is this mine going to make money? Better, because uh, well, that's why we're here. We suddenly expect to make money. When? Uh, very soon. Very soon. Refiner Brian Mann knows there will be little dory from this port. But he's not sure how little. $500 this time. Usually, Premier pours 10 whole dory bars a week, and they're worth some $20,000 a piece. But it will be some time before this mine is in the black. Both we'll to meet your cost and, and make money and pay back the loan that, you know, 
was used to, to build your facilities. 85 million bucks worth. Only in that range, yeah. That's a lot of those gold bars, or doré yes. bars, I should yeah. say. Yeah, that's right. But you're going to take them out. We have to. If you're in mining, you're an optimist. But Premier has a big head start in the northern mining game, a road. Most mines in the Golden Triangle, you have to fly to. Skyline Gold is beyond the glaciers, halfway up Johnny Mountain at 3,600 feet. Everything must be flown in. Trucks, snow caps, lumber, fuel, food, even the miners. Gold must be flown out. Flight costs burn up a quarter of the mine's operating budget. The government is considering cost sharing a road that would serve a skyline and other mines in the area. If the road were to come in, we would uh, reduce our costs by about uh, 200 to $250,000 a month which is equivalent to about uh, $50 an ounce of gold produced. Is that the difference between uh, a profit and a loss? Then? Well, it, it would, it would uh, be more than just the difference. We would be uh, very profitable at that point in time. But lack of a road hadn't been Skyline's only drawback. There isn't as much gold here as they originally thought. What is here is harder to get at than anticipated. But it is high-grade ore, and they're finding more of it all the time. Well, when you see this brown mineral, sphalerite, zinc sulfide, that's generally an indication that it's higher grade. And it looks like there's some visible gold right in here and over here. Just very fine yellow. They generally say if you can see visible gold, it's one ounce per ton. So, and this could well be this thing running one ounce per ton. For all this lucrative liquid, it will be some time before Skyline Gold starts to turn a profit. And yet they'll continue to pour money, sweat, and tears into this mine. Because their Doré bars mean more than the $180,000 they'll fetch on the market. They represent the long shot that came in, the win against all odds. Gold is more than money. It's power. If this was just a, a, a copper mine or something, it would, it would be, it'd be completely different. But gold has a very special... Uh, mystique, and I, I can't explain it, but uh, I guess I've got the gold bug. Tomorrow, the story of a man who's won and lost more money on gold than most of us will ever make. What does it do to you when you lose three million bucks on paper? Doesn't it upset no, you? No, no. Really? No. Come on. No, it doesn't. You just, uh, you just say, well, what the hell, part of the game. I should have sold some more stock when I was up, but what the hell, I'll get another shot at it. Stewart. But those in the business mention someone else when you ask about the quintessential gold miner. Like Pezum, this man has also won and lost millions of dollars on the stock market. But unlike the House Street promoter, Don McLeod's aim is to run producing mines in the Golden Triangle. He loves golden retrievers. His boat is the Dore named for the gold and silver bars he spent his life searching for, that he'll never stop searching for. You good boy? Yeah, you good boy? Oh, yeah. Don McLeod likes to say he's a miner first and a promoter second. The truth is he's both at once. What's the market? Three o'clock, 3.45, 55 left, three forty-five down 20. Uh, my nickname's Goldfinger. <laughs> Do you deserve it? Certainly I do, absolutely. He certainly does. 
this man really goes for the goal. You see glaciers on your way to almost every gold property in northwestern BC. They're just a part of the albeit awesome scenery. But Don McLeod built a road over this glacier. It snakes its way over eight miles of ice. It ends at Don's latest multi-million dollar gamble, Newhawk. At least half a million ounces of gold here, they hope. They've dug a tunnel a mile long to find out for sure. <laughs> oh boy. I'm a little nervous about Oh, don't be nervous. Not to be nervous about. The air is so humid it catches in your nose as you breathe in. Legally, you're not allowed underground until you're 18. Dawn's been sneaking into tunnels since he was 16. So this is solid rock. Yeah. And it's not going to fall down on you. Not a little chance in the world. It's uh, the most confident rock of any mine I've ever worked in. And when we get to the bottom, we'll be... Uh, uh, pretty near, about 500 feet vertically below surface. Uh, this, Aren't you a little bit nervous to be down here? Not at all. I'm right at home here. No, I, it doesn't bother me in the least. Newhawk has already spent 20 million dollars. They'll probably spend 35 million more before they go into production. If they do. And when does this mine start producing gold? Well, that's something we don't know. We, the earliest we could see it happening, under the best circumstances it would be late in 1990 or sometime early in 1991. Now that depends on a lot of things, a positive feasibility study, uh, and more importantly, the price of gold and silver. Of course, the price of gold can make or break a mine, but like the gold veins they're drilling for, nobody knows which way the price will go. Don McLeod started prospecting the year the Second World War ended. Like most of the gold diggers in Stewart back then, he worked for the big premier mine. But every spare moment he had, as his wife will tell you, he was on some mountaintop staking another claim. He staked coal, copper, silver, gold. In Ontario, Quebec, B.C. and the Yukon. But he grew up in Stewart in the days before the road. It's a time he can't say enough about, even 50 years later. But you know, that's something I like to tell you about, is the boat. When the boat came in here, the old Union steamships, it was a big event. It was, it was a, a major event in everybody's life because all the fresh supplies came in, you know, so you had fresh meat and fresh eggs, which you, otherwise you didn't have. And the new faces arrived and the old ones left. And it was a really, and we all, when we were kids, we really looked forward a lot to that Saturday boat. Today, Don brings his own boat into Stewart when he comes. With a canine crew of two and captain and wife Krista, he takes time out from his search for gold to hunt for fish. Fairly sharp. He's lost more money than he has fish. Millions in one week once when gold dropped $100 an ounce. There, that's set at 60 feet. What does it do to you when you lose three million bucks on paper? Doesn't it upset no, you? No, no. Really? No. Come on. No, it doesn't. You just, uh, you just say, well, what the hell is part of the game? I should have sold some more stock when it was up, but what the hell, I'll get another shot at it. But is that, is it that you don't get upset because you've made so many millions No, no, no. You know, I'm not in this for the money. I never have been. Most people don't believe that or understand that. It's not the money, it's the game. Really. I mean, if I had another $10 million, what the hell am I going to do with it? Go get a young chick, get divorced, have her take it all away from me? <laughs> no. No, I gotta stay with the tried and true. And fish. And fish. <laughs> <laughs> and mine. And get his family into mining. Because just up the road, 
Another gold mine is in the exploration phase. Tenajon. Basically what we're looking for here is, uh, is the ore zone. Mm -hmm. When you get into the ore zone, you'll see uh, quite a lot of sulfides, sphalerite, galena, mm -hmm. calcopyrite. And, and the man the in stuff. charge is the yeah, next the generation of McLeod. Sun Bruce has just signed a deal with the new premier mine to refine the gold ore they find here. Are you in it because your dad was in it? I'd imagine so. It, uh, I, I've lived with it since I've been uh, old enough to talk and old enough to listen. Uh, you know, I've heard probably most of those stories uh, 12 times by now, and, and a lot of them are pretty interesting. And uh, even though they do change from time to time. Get taller as they get older? Some of them, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but Dad's tails aren't quite tall enough for another family member. We're going to go across the street to the VSC and, uh, building, and we're going to see my daughter. His daughter works for Yorkton Securities. Amidst stockbrokers by the dozen who buy and sell thousands of shares a day, is one young woman who knows a lot about gold stocks. Yeah, this is Yorkton. My daughter, the broker. Oh, dear. <laughs> I just got put on television here, so. Uh, <laughs> this is very embarrassing. No. Well, it's interesting that you called your dad a promoter because he says he's not. Oh, I know, I know. He's not. He's a mining man. Oh. But, uh, is that, but is that the truth, though? Yeah, oh, definitely, wow. definitely. I wish he promoted more because I'd make a lot more money. <laughs> Maybe I was... See what I've been talking about? <laughs> Maybe if I was Murray's daughter. Uh, underground, yeah. But Catherine would be proud of her dad now because these core samples are from one of Newhawk's latest drill holes, and Dawn is promoting them. So we were up there. We were standing right at the end of your tunnel. I asked you what you think about when you're there, and you said, what the head? That's right, and guess what was ahead? <laughs> gold. <laughs> gold, gold and silver. Uh, all of the holes intersected uh, extremely high values in gold and silver, and one of the holes, 292, intersected 84 feet of over 6 ounces of gold and 50 ounces of silver. And which I predict is going to be a higher grade hole than Murray Peasants. <laughs> Such predictions fuel the stock market, that raises the money, that sends men into the mountains, over glaciers and miles underground. But as Don McLeod says, there's more to it than money. Are we crazy or what? You know, we get a one ton of rock, you know, a ton of rock is a lot of rock, to get a third to a half an ounce of gold out of it. You know, that, that's kind of magic. Or madness. But then, that's gold fever. Hard rock miners To the shaft house We must go Can't you feel the rock dust in your lungs? It'll cut down a miner when he is still young. And I feel like I'm dying from mining for gold. Yes, I feel like I'm dying from mining for gold. Gold fever has hit the Vancouver Stock Exchange, and the man behind much of this past week's frenzied trading is 68-year-old promoter, possible bridegroom, and now football impresario, Murray Pezum. The Pez, as he's known locally, made his fortune with the giant Hemlo gold mine. Now, he's claiming to have come across another gold field with just as much glitter. Few people have ever seen the territory. The town of Stewart, after all, is 1,600 kilometers from Vancouver. But when the Pez decided to take a quick trip to Stewart recently, Ventures' Gary Fowley followed right behind, and here's his report. Gold prospectors have been crossing Bear Glacier and landing in Stewart, B.C. since the Klondike. The town is closer to Juneau, Alaska than it is to Vancouver, but its fortune often swings with the Vancouver stock market. Heating up when gold fever strikes, dying down when the mines come up empty. Like they say with the VSC, buy on rumor, sell on fact. And there's not a better place that you can do that from. 
the Stewart. Stewart's claim to fame is that it's Canada's most northerly ice-free port. The folks here have made more money from gold stock on the Vancouver market than they have from the gold in the mountains above town. Thank you very much. Great point. Murray Pesham intends to change all that. He's had his eye on the Stewart area for years. He claims it could be in the center of one of North America's richest gold fields. At least that's what he's been telling the world for the past two weeks. He's still a helicopter ride away from his mine site, and he's anxious. Anxious to know how the Vancouver stock market is doing without him. It's a market he's sent to record highs based on the strength of a mine that has yet to produce an ounce. Time's a wasting. The market's almost closed. The VSE has come down with one serious case of gold fever. It's all because of gold finds along BC's SK Creek. The big discovery was here at the Calpine Mine, but speculators have sent most VSE gold stocks soaring, especially nine of the companies controlled by Murray Pesham. Geologists say the results here at Calpine are impressive. There are now 126 drill hole samples like this one. Some have as much as two ounces of gold per ton. Three to seven million ounces is what analysts say could be in the ground, not to mention the silver and other base metals. Hi, Harv. Yeah, come on, Murray. Give me some quotes. How do they close? Go ahead, Calpine. How will the fevered Vancouver market react when the market maker isn't there to fuel it? So everything was fine when it was gone, eh? When everyone was dead, suddenly a ball game was on. It's like in Vegas, you know, if they only had one crap table, everybody were on it. And that's exactly what happened. Every speculator in the world suddenly had a game to play it, and he's playing it. Pesham's crapshoot now has a market value of about $200 million. You know, I really do believe that we'll see a couple mines being developed here. But would I pay this much for the stocks? And that's where I become skeptical. That's where, you know, I'm leery of the stock prices at current levels. To live up to its market value, there are big obstacles to overcome. Fifteen miles of moose pasture and mountain between the site and the nearest road. Here, everything moves by helicopter. Hemlo, Pesham's other big gold find, sits right on the Trans-Canada. Gold prices will have to stay high because production costs per ounce of gold will be steep. I'd be reluctant to put a market capitalization of any more than $50 million on it. And even that, I think, is stretching it. These drills are going day and night, trying to prove there is enough gold to make the mine practical and profitable. And it will take three more years of drilling and $200 million to turn these drill holes into a mine. But where's that hole? Uh, 126, is that it? Let's go through that. Okay, let's take a look at 126. Pesham needs hole 126 to be as good as the others to keep his gold play going. He's also well aware the camera is here to record his reaction. It's almost pure metal. How high? How high they've been running? 50 to 80 ounces of silver. And lead? About an ounce gold. Yeah. Uh, 5 to 10 percent lead. Uh-huh. Do you think we'll have a mine here? No, I think it's just a matter of how big it's going to be now. So if you're thinking of pulling up stakes and moving to what could be this century's Klondike, forget it. The land around here has all been staked out. It just took someone like Murray Pesham to tell the world what the locals say they've known for years. Well, they must say, they must say, free gold, there may be a vein like Little Street, like that. 86-year-old John Leto didn't think much of Pesham's gold field when he first saw it, almost 60 years ago. Now he wishes he'd claimed it for himself. <laughs> How are you? Oh, it's my pleasure. <laughs> If they were to put a statue on Main Street in Stewart, it would likely be to Murray Pesham. But it takes a local miner to remind Pesham he won't be able to keep this gold fever alive without help from Eastern investors. How come you're going to the Toronto Stock Exchange? Who? You. Mary said on CBC what, Prime? Or... Yeah. Resources? We have to. We have no choice because uh, a lot of the big investors uh, won't trade stocks that are just listed on the Vancouver Stock Exchange. I don't know why, but, uh, you know. Nothing bothers Pesham more than to admit he needs establishment money. He started as a butcher in Toronto, but he's never quite fit in there. It could be his ego, his manner, or the fact he just calls them like he sees them. The East will have to finally admit that I am the greatest. As simple as that. <laughs> Nothing more. Do you think that's possible? I mean, they've given this... You know, oh, sure, this sure. This is another, pe another Pez play. This is just, you know, no big deal. Well, they can come to my bank and see how big a play it really is. <laughs>
For Venture, I'm Gary Fowley.